Okay, thank you. We are live now. Lights, camera action. Actually, lights are off. Okay. And I'll just introduce uh, Scott from the Robots are coming. And you have to introduce the uh, rest of yourself. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Phillips, and, uh, and I run a business called The Robots Are Coming. And, um, and, and this has been my way of exploring uh, various aspects of 3D printing uh, industry and, and gaming. And um, so um, I'm sure you've all heard about 3D printing and have a bit of an idea as to what it is. Um, it's been um, you know, in the news a lot over the last couple of years. And um, so we're going to, um, to get into this and um, we'll start, start at the very beginning here. We're going to have to do a fairly um, short version, so we'll be ripping right through it. What is 3D printing? Well, 3D printing is a form of additive manufacturing where a three-dimensional object is created by building it up with successive layers. And this is um, describes almost all types of 3D printing, but there's a lot of things. We'll, we'll get into the various but we'd like to uh, pair this with subtractive manufacturing, which is a much more traditional way of making things. So with subtractive, you start with a block of material, and um, by hand or by machine, you will cut bits of it away and reveal the object within, like a, like a sculpture. Um, and so we can see here um, some examples of um, uh, an object which is um, subtractive, uh, and an object here, um, which is a, a little um, online design for a soda screen, yeah. um, being printed on, on my, my solder. Um, it's quite nice to talk a little louder because people have the back. Sure, board. sure. Um, so this is the, the solid doodle uh, 3D printer. This is my, my first love in 3D printer. Um, and um, you can see here it's got a frame, and I can just uh, compare this to the to the demonstration model I've got in the front here. So the frame uh, has rails. This one, the linear rails are hidden away a little bit more. Um, has motors, step motors that run each of the axes. So this is the three three D X Y and Z um, axes, and these are all run by motors. Uh, and and actually they are controlled with G code. We'll have a look at some G code in a moment as well. Um, the electronics are tucked away around the back typically. And then you have also the, the print head. And, and the print head, in this case here, um, basically pinches the filament between a spur gear, so you know a cowboy has spurs on his boots, spiky uh, little things. Um, well, a spur gear has that shape. And, and that spiky gear has a, is next to a, um, a, a roll bearing, a skateboard bearing. And, and between the two of them, they pinch the filament. And that's what enables it to grab and drive down. So it's coming into that section and driving down. It's driving down towards this filament, down towards the extruder. We give the low res graphics here, but um, you see here um, the uh, extruder mechanism on the bottom, otherwise called the hot end, because it is obviously very hot, in fact gets to 260 degrees typically. Um, and that's a temperature at which you can guarantee that ABS plastic, which is the filament, uh, will be now you know, you have various types of filament. PLA as well, so you know, proper one or even nylon, um, if you want something um, filled with strength. Uh, and so that'll melt that and it'll uh, squeeze it out the, the nozzle here. And this is a bit like a syringe, but in this case, the plunger and the serum, it's the same thing, it's melted uh, by the uh, extruder. And this has um, a, uh, what's called a, um, a thermal resistor embedded in this um, block of aluminium. Metal there, and that's what causes it to be um, so Moving along, the print bed. Now, um, a, a decent 3D printer, in my opinion, will have a heated bed on it. Some don't, um, and you can only use PLA. This one can use both of these can use ABS plastic, which will shrink when it cools. So we need to heat the bed so that it doesn't shrink too much. If it shrinks too much, it starts to curl off. Um, so we keep that at about 100 degrees, um, and then the uh, the crucial aspect really is to get the first layer height exactly right. So you want it to be about 0.1 of a millimetre, but uh, you don't want it too close to the print bed, which needs to also be leveled up a bit, um, and um, you don't want it too high. If 
because if it's just too close, it doesn't have enough room for the stuff to come out. Um, and if it's too high, it's a bit like those you know, dental aids when they're putting toothbrush, toothpaste on a toothbrush and it's all coming out as a, as a wobbly cylinder. You actually want it to be pushed down like it's into the bristles of your toothbrush. Um, but not too, not too high. So um, that's, that's that. That's given us a, a nice little um, cook's tour of how a uh, fused deposition modeling 3D printer works. Um, so we're going to just blaze through this section. This is, uh, I kind of want to skip through this uh, pretty quick to save time. So for a start, this is, this is the, the 3D printing workflow. It's what you need to do to get your head out to, uh, to make a print. Um, and um, we've, we've been printing um, an object in the other room. In fact, it's, it's completed um, now. Um, and this is the process that we've gone through. So um, you'll need an STL file. This is typically the file format. Three D printing, um, and you really have well three options to get your hands on an STL file. It's really boiled down to two. Um, firstly, you can create your own using CAD software. That's a very typical way. Um, you can scan something from real life, and uh, you might have seen the three D bodies that we've got there next door. Um, or you can download one from the Thingiverse, from the Internet repository of three D objects. Um, we'll have a look at Thingiverse in a minute, but, but really you might notice that, um, that this uh, kind of boils down to either one of these. So anything that's on Thingiverse will either have been CAD modeled or scanned. Um, if you're creating your own, you can choose between vector modeling software and parametric modeling software. Um, the difference is um, uh, a little bit of leaving those two things. Uh, and some various types of modeling software that you can use here and some parametric modeling software. So the, really the difference with parametric is that it uses parametric equations to define the object and then it can output um, the vector based STL format at any resolution that you choose. Way more flexible and you can fool around with your design instruments. Um, and um, one really terrific that I teach in schools a lot uh, is Tinkercad. This is um, uh, using um, object primitives. So you can just basically drag and drop uh, cubes and spheres and pyramids into the design area. Very intuitive handles and stuff. You can move things around. And then it's got a great engine for doing Boolean subtraction. So you can subtract a, a sphere from a cube and create an interesting object that way. And um, you, you, you let a high school kid or a primary school age kid um, loose on this stuff with you know, half an hour's training and they will design some incredible stuff. It's very intuitive. So um, scanning um, is uh, the, other, the other method. And um, here we can see the matter and form 3D scanner. And, um, and this is a, a beautiful machine that is fairly grand, which is incredibly cheap. Historically um, speaking, and um, I, I've got one of these at home, and um, I scanned a little sea and enemy shell, a sea urchin shell, and, um, and when I came out of about 80 megabytes of file, high quality, and when I zoomed right in, each little dot on there had about two or three hundred data points on it, so very high resolution. And so these are. Um, Scans from my 3D body scanner. I think actually I did this one by hand before I built the contraption. And uh, here's a couple of prints watching TV in the miniature lounge room. And um, here's a couple on my kitchen phone. And this is the, uh, the, the CAD file, really, of the, um, of the machine that's, that's out of that. So, and, and in fact, this was all um, designed in parametric CAD software. and. I just basically modelled up the bits that I needed to have made real. Um, so there's a little uh, pulley carriage at the top. This has a whole timing belt inside it, much like a 3D printer. A little step down the bottom there. And these, this carriage here and the pulley housing, um, I just designed them and then bang, jumped into the 3D printer, printed them out, and put them together. Um, usually, you know, what do we want? I think that one, that one happened first, uh, I think it's the only one I've ever printed. Um, this one's been through the design cycle. And 
And um, so you can th full color print out of, uh, out of these. Now, these are a little bit fragile, so I'm not going to twist this around. Um, but a bit of white light, you can see um, that you can 3D print these in full color. So um, we'll have a look at this in a moment. Um, this is a process called bind jetting. Um, and um, so you can make 3D color, uh, color 3D prints. Um, and actually while we're here, I'll uh, pass this to you and you can pass them around. Um, and uh, yeah, we can pass that around for now. So that's a uh, good sort of scanning. So the, um, the Thingiverse is the online repository, the most famous online repository. This is they position themselves like YouTube for 3D printable objects. Um, and um, uh, so this is um, one of the first objects that I that I modelled up and I put it up onto the Thingiverse, um, the Super Mario Spitfire. And here we can see that um, after I uploaded it, some guy downloaded the files, printed it out on his own machine, and has taken a photo of it and stuck it up on the Thingiverse. Um, <laughs> and so I get Toby Jazz mapped out. So once you've got your STL file, you want to position it on the 3D printing software. Um, so this is the software for my for my old machine, um, but I, I like to use this still because it sort of shows the wiring under the board. The board is. Um, and so we can just basically pop it on there, we can make a copy of it. In fact, at one time I, I printed uh, 30 at a time or something, 30 different objects, you can really stack them up. You can, you can rotate them around what you like, you can scale them up. And then you need to slice it, and, and this is a, uh, a, a foundation concept in, in all this. This is the slicing software interface for Compose. Um, in the software for the up, and I have to introduce my, my little friend here, this is the up. Plus 3D printer, uh, plus an extrusion printer. Um, you can't see any of this in the, um, the software for the up. It's sort of all in the ran away, it's a little bit proprietary. Um, but with this open source software, you certainly can. And this here is the G code that controls the machine when it operates. So each, each um, line in here is basically that moving in a certain way. Uh, there be, might be, you know, three or four hundred lines of code for a typical object. So a lot of, a lot of data flying through it. Um, and um, you can see here, this G code is a, um, an, an X instruction, or position coordinate, uh, a Y instruction, and an E instruction. So the X and Y means that way and that way. And then the E is for the extrusion the step motor. So that tells it how much toothpaste to squeeze out of the tube and it's, it's moving. And uh, here we can see a, a, a visualisation of the, the tool path it's going to take for, for this object. Um, and printing it now. You need to warm the printer up, the, the heated bed particularly. It takes a while to heat up. Uh, you want to set the filament. Here's the extruder for, for that um, on the machine. Um, and uh, you really usually want to do a test extrusion or you might want to change the colour. And uh, you sometimes need to level the bed. So you want that to be nice and looking before you can start to print. Uh, and these are your things here. Now, we'll, we will just switch. Oh, no, hang on. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's uh, escape out of here. And I'll just pull that video out because we don't have it being connected up to the interwebs yet. So it's just going down and the, the printhead's moving around. You can see here it's building it up. 
the, the wings. I've actually split the, the Spitfire in two parts so that it could be printed without the need for support because that machine was um, pretty terrible for support material. And um, actually, that's um, probably a, a good time to explain that. So the, uh, the, the printer, when it prints, uh, it actually prints it as liquid plastic. So you can't do an, an overhang um, without building up support. So there's a whole system, and you can see with the object that's been printed on the other machine, that uh, it's built um, support all around uh, Charity's feet, scanned her, and she's wearing a skirt. Um, and so it, it, it built all the support around so that you could print the skirt. That, um, that, that the first um, part of the skirt would have just all fallen everywhere without the support. You put like, scaffolding so that it all holds it in place. Um, and then uh, you can remove the support. This is what it's like with the old uh, solid doodle. You need a pair of pliers to, to do it. Um, but the up plus is much more forgiving. Um, and you can usually just break away bits of fingers. You can sand it, um, you can glue them together, use the acetone, and you can also do a, uh, a process called an acetone vapor bath. And this is akin to, um, to glazing with the ceramic process. Um, and using the um, vaporized acetone, you basically put it on the heated bed of your printer and um, a tablespoon of acetone. All the ladies in the audience will know what acetone is. For the gentleman, it's not um, And um, uh, that will then vaporize, and the vapor is heavier than air, so it forms an invisible bar, and then it condenses onto the object where you don't have to touch it with a paintbrush and start moving molecules around. And, um, and then you can very carefully move that out of there, and it'll dry it and kind of glaze. So then you can get a really smooth finish on the print. And this is really a hack that turned up on the internet so six months after I started playing with this. Um, and then finally, in this process, um, you use it. So my dishwasher at home is just chock a block full of 3D printed objects. Uh, <laughs> the wheels, the clips, you know, all this stuff eventually breaks. Um, and, um, and I just got a few designs that I just repeatedly bang out you know, new ones. Um, and, and usually uh, update the designs as we go. So this is the, uh, an interesting uh, part of this, which is the 3D printing technology. So we'll, again, we'll just rip through. How are we going for time? Oh, uh, we have another 15 minutes. Another 15 minutes, all right. We will super rip through this, because I really want to get onto the application. Fused deposition modeling is this sort of stuff, plastic extrusion. You can also do screw extrusion of different materials. Chocolate is a really good material for 3D printing. True. What do you mean chocolate? Uh, well, chocolate is great because it, um, you know, this transition temperature is pretty low, so it melts easily and it goes hard easily. Um, so there are commercially available chocolate 3D printers, for sure. Um, ceramic 3D printers has been adapted from a uh, bits from bites machine. Oh, I'm losing this again. Don't worry about it. Um, stereo lithography is um, the first type of 3D printing ever. So it's been around for 30 years. Any car that you've driven that was made since the mid 80s would have had dashboard components and gear sticks and whatever prototyped with stereolithography. And the models made, made directly from it. He's the guy who invented it, which, um, Charlie Hull. Um, and 3D Systems, his company, is really one of the, the lines of the industry, um, along with Strasis. Uh, so this is uh, an amazing machine. I kickstarted it, I still haven't received my kit. Um, called the Peachy 3D printer. And um, this is using a, this all uses photocatalytic resin. So um, typically um, it's a, a resin that uh, is shone a laser light onto, and that laser light will um, catalyze reaction in the resin and change it from a liquid state into a solid state. And that's uh, dependent then on how tightly you can focus a laser beam which turns out is, is pretty tough. So you get really um, great quality prints of these. If we have time, we'll go back and look at the video. Um, this, uh, this is an amazing, very new technology called Clip, continuous light, uh, continuous liquid interface production. And um, uh, with this one, you, you, it's kind of this, but upside down. So, the, so it's 
pulling it out off there. But um, this is called Carbon 3D, look it up on YouTube, it's fantastic. It's a video, it takes one minute, but sped it up seven times, so it takes seven minutes. But they can print an object uh, not dissimilar to this one uh, on that video. Let's move it past around. This took me eight and a half hours to print. It's, all those elements are hollow, um, which saves time, but still took eight and a half hours. This one um, can do that in eight minutes. You can put it to print overnight and go to sleep, can you? Oh, this, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with this one, you wouldn't even be in bed before it's finished. <laughs> um, so we'll just, we'll just rip through this one. Time. Polyjet is another type of uh, printing process. It's also um, photocatalytic, and it's basically ink jetting polymer down and using a UV light to catalyze the reaction and make it go hard. With this one, you can do different materials in the same print, so you can get a flexible um, aspect and a solid aspect in the same print. Pretty cool. Um, and, um, and this is going to turn into a full color printing process. It's not quite there yet. Um, but this one is binder jetting. This is the little model I sh showed before. And um, see here, this is a, uh, a binder jetting machine. And what this is basically doing is using gypsum powder, so a white um, plaster dust basically, and then it's squirting, uh, injecting glue into each layer. So it'll, it'll do that and put another layer of very fine dust over it, and we'll come along with the inkjet printer again to do another layer. This uh, video is about the presentation. Uh, the M4 Iris is another one, this is uh, using standard office paper, they print with standard office printer um, and then put those pages, pages, pages um, into a machine to cut all that and glue it all together. Um, pretty complicated, um, pretty interesting. Selective laser sintering is a nylon dust based process. Um, and um, this is quite similar, but instead of glue, you're using the heat from the laser beam to sinter the material together. And, um, coming out, and this is the sort of complexity that you get for free with this sort of 3D print. Um, so you don't have to pull all the support material out of this, that would be tedious with a machine like this, but with um, selective laser sintering, it's all just dust, it's the nylon dust, it's the support and the build material. So you just basically shake these and all dust. Um, and then electron beam melting. So this is the sort of industrial side of things and the medical side of things. Um, going to that graphic, no. um, but you can see up here, this is a little graphic of a replacement hip joint. It's been um, made with uh, out of titanium and powder. And uh, similar to the um, sint sort of laser sintering, but this uses a electron beam, an electron beam uh, inside a vacuum like your old TV set, uh, because then that's got the power, which the laser can't quite achieve, to fully melt the titanium. And you can see that's actually what I've been able to do is um, print a sort of soft uh, mesh effect on the back of that, so that the, the person's hip bone can actually grow into that part. And we're going to dive into some of the applications for 3D printing. How are we going for time? Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes, so minutes, right? we can That's ask nice. some questions. I, I, I can sense a longer event coming up. Maybe we can have one at our Silicon offices in BTC. Sure. And maybe like, how long do you reckon? Like two or three hours where we can really go into it? Yeah, let's talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, so running out of time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, prototyping is um, the, the reason I got into 3D printing in the first place, um, and it's an obvious application. It's been happening for 30 odd years. Uh, jewelry. Um, this, these two pieces of design. This is something like Thingiverse. Um, this again, uh, replacement parts. Maybe the dishwasher bit. Um, and this guy's um, designing um, fancy creeps that are like. Uh, decorations, there's a whole universe of 
stuff uh, possible there. Um, Christmas ball, so it's good. Uh, do it yourself projects. This guy's used three printed parts for the hexagonal, uh, pentagonal sections for his uh, speaker. On the direction of the speaker. Um, this is a fun project uh, around the idea of upcycling. So it's the R plus, and this guy's printing all these different attachments that he's designed to go onto jars and tin cans and stuff you'll throw out and you recycle. Um, to give these, um, these things a, a new lease on life. So you've got pen holders and money boxes, citrus juices, that's a barbell, that's a spaghetti can, and a birdhouse. So all fun stuff. Uh, litho fanes. So these are really fun. I'll, I'll pass this around. This is my Facebook profile picture. It looks like not much that way. But um, when you hold these up to the light, and you can actually see that, then you get an opacity effect in it, then pass it around, hold up to that projector beam, it will um, work. Um, this is actually really old art form and um, with a bomb twist. These do it with um, slip cast porcelain ceramic uh, and wax models and positive to start with, pre photography in the 1600s. Uh, so we're into some medical applications now, uh, dentistry, we're using this a lot more, um, that horrible yellow gummy stuff there to get the impression. If you get that these days they just show a um, some um, show a scanner in your mouth and you scan your teeth, email that to the orthodontist, he's got it, you know, if you retain the number by the afternoon. Uh, bioprinting, I actually have a whole other talk on bioprinting. This is completely incredible. Uh, this is a 3D printed collagen structure of a ear, a human ear, um, which is soaked in stem cells stem cells, um, and this was actually um, surgically implanted onto the back of a rat, and it grew like rat skin and fur over it. Um, so this is going to be big in terms of you know gunshot wounds, blah blah blah. All this plastic. Well, it's putting the plastic in plastic surgery. Um, prosthetics. You know, amputees have been suffering dirty pink fiberglass for way too long, and now people will stop them in the street and congratulate them. Uh, what would otherwise be called a plaster cast. In this case, it's made of plaster, it's not cast, it's uh, silicon blades and sinker out of nylon. And uh, you can see along here, there's a bit of a, a bit of seam there. And you can actually open this up with a clamshell, shove your broken arm in there, I'll see a doctor, um, and um, close it shut and it becomes nice and rigid. And you can put the sleeve over it or wear it in the bra. Maybe not. It's covered by copyright design. Sorry? Um, I th well, most of these are open source projects. I think that might be. Um, so um, now this is where the rubber really hits the road. I think um, architecture. This guy here. Oh no. This guy here um, doesn't do fly through animations or you know the CAD data to his clients. He'll print a model and ship it in a box, and they pick it up. Go. Um, and um, and you, when you do that, you get a really um, fantastic uh, feeling and experience of the shape of the object. So I used to use a service called Shapeways in Holland. I'd send away a bit of silicon blades and sinkers and stuff. But I'm, I'm fooling around with it in CAD for a start. I've never held the thing in real life. And and then I, you know, pay with the cocoa and wait two weeks. And okay, I'm like a kid on Christmas morning. Never Turns up. But um, when I get it out, it's amazing to touch something with your design for the first time, um, and and you then you go, oh, that's the that's the scale of it, right? I get it. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, this is a, a Dutch project called Canal House, where they three D printing an entire house out of uh, melt-down milk bottles. This is Enrico Dini out of Italy's project, and he worked out a way to. Um, change the crystalline structure of sand with an organic compound, um, turning sand into sandstone in a 3D printer. This is huge. So they really need to turn this for. Um, and then concrete extrusion. This is where the stuff gets a bit real. Um, this is the University of Southern California's project. Um, the contour crafting. 
So they actually put the concrete into the 3D printing machine? Yes, well, um, we're just going to here. This is what they are looking at doing, a joint venture, I believe, going with Caterpillar. Um, so the idea is, this is the 3D printer, right? It comes on a truck, you roll it out on these tracks, you have some, um, a two-man crew running it, uh, you attach it to a um, cement pump and a cement mixer, and um, you printing out the walls. You can do it with square corners, so that's a silly idea, because um, they're actually weak and round corners, but try to get a brick to make round corners on your house, you can plan all day. Um, and then instead of putting the support material up, they just have the simple thing of robotically dropping the window lid tools, the door lid tools, you know, cheap tricks. They roll the roof on like a roller door, you can print over the top of it, and keep on going up. So the idea here is that you can get a house to lock up from from a port slab to lock up in 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if anything's going to do it, this would be supposed to do it. So um, this then is really going to, you know, burst the lid open for future architects um, using this technology um, and, and really the sky's the limit in terms of what can be done. I've seen um, ideas for for towers that are designed so that the 3D printer can, you know, uh, make little holes in the side of it and can climb its way up the up the tower as it goes and just disassemble the thing. Um, so that's that, and we'll get into here. This is a little, you know, quick sketch of the future directions for 3D printing. Um, multiple colours is a is a big game, and we're going to see a lot more. Stuff happening there. Uh, Hewlett Packard are uh, heavily rumoured to be coming into the industry with a um, uh, sensational, hopefully, 3D printing solution. Uh, full colour. This one's done on a, on a multi headed printer, like one of these with three extruders on it. Um, and this one is a, um, a printer with multiple filaments coming into a single print head so they can blend the colours through there. You're not going to be able to put a photograph on this, but um, it's getting there. And then there's those other colour processes. Multiple materials, this is also awesome. You know, some um, technology is doing this, but um, dissolving support material is a very useful thing if you have uh, multiple printheads on the, on the machine. Uh, electronics is uh, notoriously difficult in this space. Uh, this one is a sort of system with like 3D printed buttons that you can just you know, change the resistive uh, nature of the filament, but that's not going to get you really a working circuit. Um, there's this fucking system with you know, sphere balls of liquid metal, um, totally terrible. But um, increasingly we're seeing, and I don't have them on the, on the thing here, um, silver impregnated um, filaments that do actually have um, high levels of conductivity. Okay, we're out of time for the presentation. All right. If anyone has questions? <coughs> yes. Yeah,
equivalent recycling machine, so you could get one of these for 150 bucks or something. Um, and this is designed to um, accept uh, used filament, bits of 3D prints, uh, grind them down, melt them up, and extrude it back into 3D printed filament. And in fact, you can uh, you can shove milk bottles in this thing and get uh, milk bottle coloured filament out and, um, and recycle it that way. Uh, the other the other side of 3D printing, which speaks to what you're talking about, um, is the fact that you're not um, you're not wasting the whole the, all the material from outside of the, from from within the block. You know, um, subtractive manufacturing is far more wasteful um, in that sense. And um, the uh, aeronautics and uh, aerospace industry and the automotive industry are really big, particularly the aerospace industry, are very big on the they call the buy to fly ratio. So how much material do they have to buy um, compared to how much material it gets to fly? And with subtractive, it's like that to this, a really tiny amount. But with um, so the titanium printing, um, then you really, you're getting close to one to one. There's really not very much waste in all that, all the material, the metal dust gets recycled and reused. So um, pretty much whatever you put in, it comes out as a useful part. You mentioned that you've done you've done some work with schools. I'm curious to know what what applicability does this have, say, in primary school kids? I mean, how do you get them engaged, or how could you use this other than just building a model um, that would benefit the kids as oh, part of their yeah, work? Okay. Uh, so um, what I, what I love about this is I'm particularly working with primary school kids. I've mostly worked with high school kids, but but primary school kids are. Um, much more uh, obviously enthusiastic about it. They are really, you know, like magnets to it. Um, and, and, and they'll get in and, and, and learn the skills probably faster than high school age kids, really. Um, and, um, but, but they can then use this in, in, a, in a huge variety of ways to mesh in with other parts of the curriculum. So um, history, we can download artifacts, you know, you can download a, a belt buckle from a Viking um, and, um, and like theatre props, artefacts from uh, literary you know, works, um, a whole, whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, mathematics and science, there's a huge amount of sort of, uh, machines for doing electrolysis of, of water and hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah, so you were talking about this database. So basically, in terms of that, people are just uploading uh, their, their plans or, or what they've come yep. up with onto that. But is there like a crossover point where you know, businesses are putting up their plans and you have to? So what, what I'm trying to say is, that is there like a marketplace that's on there, like a like an app store style thing where you've got your guys that are just mucking around with things on the weekend and come up for free, and yep. there's your big business putting up these. So yeah, Thingiverse it runs on Creative Commons licensing, and um, and you can select with Creative Commons you can select your various few flavors of Creative Commons license. So you can have um, attribution, non-commercial, or you can release it for commercial use. Um, that's really goes to your question there. Um, but there's no there's no doesn't seem to be any um, structure around that. There's yeah. no IT infrastructure kind of guiding that. You might point to this one. Are you purchasing something? You might go looking for a particular, say, dishwashing part, and you'll go into a file and you see, oh, this, this costs money or something, and then yeah, that that's not that's not baked into Thingiverse, but there are um, other um, repositories okay. that pay for purely you, know, you, you, you pay for downloads. Yeah, okay. um, so, but I haven't seen anything that looks grown up about that yet. Yeah, yeah that's still very nice. Yeah. So it's a bit like uh, YouTube Thingiverse, like this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Technology goes to a new playground, just like printing. 
static parts, uh, but can we make mo uh, mobile parts as well? Yes, well, uh, this, this object that's going around here, the green um, train mail, um, that's, that's been printed as a single piece. So you can do all sorts of moving mechanical uh, objects if you, if you know what you're doing. Um, and the trick is to not get them fused together. And this is like, you know, sort of whole tennis level of this sort of stuff. Uh, um, is it possible to use ferromagnetic uh, substances inside the thing and uh, control its uh, wire temperature? We can actually keep it uh, non magnetic at the beginning and then later it becomes magnetic. Uh, something oh, I would say. Is there any research going on? As, as this gets all gets um, higher resolution and more materials being able to be deployed in a single machine, um, there's one of the universities in, in the States that actually build a machine that will do 20 materials or something like that. So, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's pretty interesting. But still, you're going to have a lot of, it's going to be, you know, cold day in hell before you can print an iPhone, really. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible, but to to get to that level of precision in terms of oh my god, what the CCD and your camera, etc. You know, no, we're talking nanotech. I didn't mean mobile things, uh, mobile parts like. Uh, no, what I meant is yeah, like I know. something that is mobile, like yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. So to be able to 3D print an electric motor yeah, yeah. would be then awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's um, and um, you know, once you can do that, that's going to open. Pandora's box, you know, over here as well, you know, in a different direction. I think we are out of time, but we need to hand over the building back to Sean. It's by six o'clock, so we have 15 minutes. So, can you please stand strong? <laughs> we have any questions you can catch him because he'll be packing up his. Uh, <laughs>